So we get about six to eight liters every day from our cow. Um, sorry, Joaquin. What do we do with all this milk? What the heck do we do with all this milk? All right, well here, got a little example. I have some fresh yogurt. This one says Matsoni. It's a, apparently a Matsoni culture. Jessica, what other cultures? We have other cultures, right? We got the Matsoni yes, we do. among others. We have four. We got a four pack. They're called Heritage Cultures. We got them from Cultures of Health. It's Matsoni. Okay, forgive me if I mispronounce it. I gotta say, Masoni, Pima, Filmjolk, and Vili. Right, so one, the Masoni is from Georgia, the, and then the other three, two are Icelandic, and one is Swedish, if I remember correctly. Okay. They all have very unique tastes. I don't know, my favorite seems to change regularly. I like them all. Uh, this one is a little bit more creamy. The mazzoni, a little bit more creamy, and you can see how the cream kind of separated on the top there. So anyways, what do we do with all this milk? We make yogurt, we make yogurt cheese, we make cheeses, sometimes we drink the milk. Um, I like to drink the raw milk, the kids very often like to drink the raw milk, uh, but me, personally, the m bulk of calories that I consume from raw dairy comes, Ryder's moving stuff around now, he's always, they're always rearranging the house. Um, comes from yogurt. It's fermented, right? So most of the carbohydrates are actually fermented out. Full fat, and then got live bacteria in it. Very soothing for the gut. I find that this is something I digest incredibly well. So among other things, among uh, many other animal foods, this is very easily digestible, very easy to assimilate, and I love it. So we'll show you how to make homemade yogurt, homemade raw milk yogurt, because it's so freaking good. Mm. Ah. Okay, so we finished milking the cow. Today we got like six liters, says six. Jessica. Yeah. Wow, you look extra beautiful today. Aww. You don't notice how beautiful your Must wife be is my until you see her in the camera. <laughs> so, um,. We finished milking the cow, usually six to eight liters. One time we got 10. My favorite way to consume milk, I love raw milk, right? One of the most amazing, most versatile foods in the world. Um, live enzymes, live bacteria, super good for the gut. I don't know, it's just, it's a great way to quickly get in calories. Um, and it's one of the most convenient foods that you can feed your family off of your own land. Like yeah. One cow can produce, if you have a good cow, you can be getting 10 to 20 liters a day. Right, depending on the time, depending on if you have a calf that's nursing. Um, our cow is producing pretty well right now. It's her first pregnancy, her first calf. Hopefully after the next calfing, she'll be giving even more. And then once we get rid of Joey, which will eventually slaughter the him. Calf. The, calf the calf is Joey, he's a, a bull. We'll probably end up slaughtering him because he's not gonna be of age uh, or ready to, uh, to make boom boom when our cow Floor is ready to be impregnated. So we'll probably end up slaughtering him at like a year old when he's really big, maybe like a year and a quarter. Um, so at that point, we'll have even more milk and then she'll get pregnant again and then the whole cycle begins again. I wanna say something cool about Floor that I just saw for the very first time today. Tristan's been telling me this for, what, like a week or so now, but she has five nipples. <laughs> And it's really funny. Flora's a, she's <laughs> really a deformed funny. cow. She's an extra nipple. In the States, at commercial dairies, like at big producers where they're using a milking machine, they would consider that a defect and they would get rid of that calf, right? They wouldn't want a cow that had five nipples because the machines, they have four suckers. Right, they don't fit. They got four sucker cups. So um, we don't care. I think it's cool. She has an extra nipple. And it doesn't mean that they'll produce more milk, right? Which I learned, and it's pretty rare. I think it's like one in a thousand, maybe. Oh, that's how special Flora is. She's very special. <laughs> she's especially crazy. Um, yeah, she is. No, but she's really cool. She's just young. She was. She went through her adolescence, and she was a little bit difficult. But we're gonna make yogurt today. Okay. We use cultures of health's cultures to start these, 
and we do we have like an affiliate link so we'll throw the affiliate link in the description below and uh, they're really easy to start you just follow the instructions to start out the culture they're super easy and what I like about these is that it's raw milk yogurt right so there's no heating you don't have to worry about temperature control I take the culture um, this is a Matsoni culture that we're working from Georgia I know the ratio is one cup of raw milk per one tablespoon of yogurt so I like to keep there's no difference what I'm using here as a starter this you could just eat it like normal yogurt I just like to keep it in a separate jar so I know that I have starter culture and I don't accidentally eat all the yogurt before I inoculate another batch right because it's like it's like a sourdough or something you want to keep your starter so you can keep making and, more and more and, more and you can take your favorite yogurt from the store and try to make a starter with that but something that we were just discussing, I'm not sure if most of them are going to actually work properly because, like we said before, some of these cultures require specific temperature for fermentation. Right. These you, ones, we can leave at room temperature, which is nice. Yeah. So it may or may not work exactly with your store-bought yogurt. You might want to sterilize the milk first and then inoculate it with the culture to be determined. All right. So how do we do it? All right. So I know this is six cups of raw milk, so I simply take six tablespoons of yogurt starter and put it in the jar. Like this. So you use your hand, you put the spoon <laughs> in there. You, there's like a swooping motion, you're gonna have to practice that one. And you gotta know how to count to six. Four, five, and six. six. All right, and then, and then practicing. I do stir it. Because what I notice, if you don't stir it, if you don't stir it, the culture, it, it sticks to the cream. Right, so as the milk sits a little bit and the cream rises to the top, your culture is also going to rise up to the top. So if it's not mixed in well, you'll notice the thicker line here, it gets kind of, a, it'll get more fermented than the bottom part. Tell them about when it sticks to the side and when you reuse a jar. Now we're using new clean jars because they're aesthetically nice, but yeah. if we had, uh, if we weren't filming this, we would just take an old jar that we already had yogurt in and ferment it in there. Why is that? True, because it goes faster. Right, so if you have science. a- Science. Yes, science, science says. <laughs> when you have a jar and it's just coated with all the yogurt, uh, bacteria and enzymes and whatnot, and then you inoculate it with the fresh milk and the starter, it just goes, it is actually significant. I mean, it goes multiple hours faster. It's like it's spread more uniformly throughout it, so yeah. it doesn't have to travel so far. Apply a cheesecloth. Where right, can you just, get a cheesecloth? You can find a cheesecloth they like- They have them at Cultures for Health too. Yeah, or but also like use stores. diapers or- uh, tea if you have, if there's homeless people in your area, if you live in San Francisco, you could just use like one of their shirts. No, I'm kidding, not a used diaper. The idea is that you want some airflow going, uh, but you don't want bugs to get in it or dust or you know anything. Um, so I secure it with a rubber band, Boom. and it's puesto. Yeah. If you don't have a cheesecloth, right, you could use a tea towel or a coffee filter, a paper towel, or just lightly. Put the lid on, just rest the lid. So Cultures of Health, I'm following their directions and they recommend you do that ratio of one tablespoon of yogurt starter per one cup of milk up to two liters. And what happens if you do more than two liters? Because you did try that. It works for me. It worked. It works. Okay, but so like that's a disclaimer, right? Is like <laughs> we're breaking the rules here if you do more than two liters, although it worked for me. So I'm still experimenting. Maybe I'll run in. I did three liters. Now it's inoculated, right? The milk's ready, but where do we put it? What temperature do we do, right? Because temperature does matter. If you're we're going for like 70 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so I just keep it next to the stove. So if I'm slow cooking, I do notice that it goes a little bit faster. Uh, if it's not, if it's just a normal day, ambient temperature, it takes about 24 hours. Um, if it's warmer, like if you're more towards the 77 degree, then you're gonna get it in maybe 16 to 18 hours. So I just put it over here in a warm, dry spot. Next to the stove. And that's it? Pretty simple? Super easy. Tristan Super could do it. I could do that. I could have done that. I still don't do it though. <laughs> Ever. Ever. <laughs> yeah, but I milk the cow. That's true. She helps. Um, tomorrow, we'll show you the finished product. We'll show you how we eat it. And um, yeah, yeah, here's the rest of the milk. What are you gonna do with the rest of this? You know what? I'm saving up to make my very first aged cheese recipe and it calls for two gallons of milk. The recipe, the title, is an 18th century cheddar cheese. But it's white, good. aged, pressed. Do you like it?
Because you can just tell it is. Strawberry. All right, so we're about 24 hours on the dot since when I inoculated this yesterday. And oh. if you tip it yep. ever so gently. You can see, look at the cream separates on top. Yeah. Wow, nice and thick. Yeah, so as soon as it separates from the glass wall here in a solid curd, they call it yog. Y-O-G-E, -E. it's like congeal. But as soon as you see that, it's done. There you go. It's done. And I've experimented on fermenting it longer to see if there's a benefit or if it gets thicker curd, but I haven't, I haven't really noticed it. I think actually we prefer it when, it, when you catch it after it's just started to congeal. And I've checked it before and it hasn't set yet and you can tell maybe the top part, the cream is separated and it's a little thicker, but the bottom part, it's just, it's totally runny and it's just like milk. So you just put it back, let it sit, come back an hour or two later and check it again. Super, super easy. Super Very easy, simple. yeah. And so the next step of what we may do with this, sometimes we turn it into cheese. Yeah. We throw the lid on, put it in the fridge, or we turn it into cheese. Turning it into cheese is, it's a pretty difficult, single step process of basically taking a cheesecloth, straining out the whey. Here is what the whey looks like. You can see there's a little bit of like cheesy sediment on the bottom and then there's just that like Gatorade looking liquid. This stuff is amazing. I, I really like drinking whey. I, I don't know, yogurt's good. Yogurt's great. I digest it really well. Raw milk's great. I digest yogurt probably better. Like I can have more yogurt than raw milk. Yeah. Digest it, right? Easier digested. But whey and yogurt cheese, basically you're getting the same things as yogurt, but it's kind of nice to have the cheese, the yogurt cheese on like a burger or something or have it on the side of a steak and then drink the whey. So I like to drink this whey like during the day. I get really sweaty, lose electrolytes. Um, it's just, it's so refreshing. It's so tasty. The cheese is amazing. It's really good. We do it a lot on burgers and like slow cook fried meat, right? So I'll take short ribs, or like beef from beef and slow cook them overnight. And I separate out the meat and then I can eat that hot or like next day later with the leftovers, you take that and you pan fry it on the skillet until the edges are crispy. And it's like beef carnitas. It's really good. It's really good. And it so is really good. That with cheese is nice. Pretty much no matter what you do with raw milk, it's gonna be really good. <laughs> right. Aged cheeses, semi-aged cheeses, yogurt, kefir, kefir, mm -hmm. kefir, however you wanna say it. Apparently it's kefir. We've said kefir for like 10 years. Um, all of them are great. We like to make kefir cheese as well. Yep, which is the same thing, right? You have your kefir, you let it ferment on the counter, and then when it's done, you strain out the kefir grains, separate those, because that's your culture. You know, you want to save that to do another batch, and then you run it through a cheesecloth. That's what we do with raw milk most days. Uh, most days. One of the most versatile foods you can have. It is a way that you can feed, you can provide many of your kids and your family's nutritional needs off of your own land. And that's why this stuff is under heavy attack, right? The same economic entities, the same global economic interests, the same international interests that created the factory farming system, that tried to remove the small family farmer from the equation. These are the same people who are pushing um, both grain-fed feedlot beef, right? They've consolidated a lot of the beef processing industry, uh, but also these are the people who are pushing these plant-based diets. All right, so these big, massive corporations, these mega corporations pushing these plant-based diets as a way to save the planet. It's not really about saving the planet. It's not really about saving the animals. It's about making money. And it's about the consolidation of the food supply and the removal of your food sovereignty, the removal of our ability to feed ourselves off of our own land. So that's why we're all about eating meat and making families. So we're all about homesteading. That's why we're all about becoming as self-sufficient as we can off of our own land. All right, so we can take this milk, make value added products with it, trade it for other things or sell it and buy meat. All right, so all of our nutritional needs can be met from a few animals on a small piece of land. Obviously not everybody's got access to land, but there are cow shares in the States mm -hmm. that you can get down on. You can get your own raw milk from there. Uh, there are resources like eatwild.com. 
um, what's the other one? Realmilk.com, where yeah. you can learn about where you can find good raw milk near you. So that's it. You're way more than what you eat. Your food is pretty dang important. The foods that you eat are important in more ways than just one, right? right. They're more important than just nutrition. There's a lot more going on here. Anyways, we'll see you next time. You can find more at PrimalEdgeHealth.com uh, if you guys want to learn more about how to feed yourselves with nutrient-dense, nourishing animal foods. Check out the Carnivore Cookbook. There's going to be a link down in the description below. If you're looking at starting a carnivorous diet, Check out the Quick Start Guide to Carnivory and 21-Day Carnivore Diet Meal Plan. There's a link down in the description below. We teach you how to ease into the diet, how to add foods later on, and experiment with other foods like dairy here. Mm -hmm. right? Many people do quite well with raw dairy. It's about what works for you in your individual context and your situation. So get off the freaking computer. Get away from the social media, social engineering screens. Kill your television set, cut off your freaking Facebook account, cancel your damn Netflix subscription, stop listening to puffed up, vain, narcissistic, idolatrous celebrities telling you what to do and how to live your life and what to put in your body. Get out there and create real communities, real homesteads, eat real food, go live your life.